Welcome to the uh, Board of County Commissioners um, open session uh, for February the 1st. And as always, we will start with uh, Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and uh, I want to start with Priority Carol, and I'll mention that uh, Commissioner Rothstein is in Annapolis with the uh, shock trauma people today, representing us there, and will not be in, in the meeting either virtually or otherwise. And I think we've got, in the next couple months, a few of us may be virtual for meetings as we travel and do stuff, but... Uh, we're trying to accommodate busy schedules in everyone. Commissioner Guerin. Good morning, Carroll County. I actually don't have a priority, Carol, this morning, so I'll uh, reserve the rest of my time for critique and comments of my fellow commissioners. Priority, <laughs> Carol, so I'll do that. So uh, good I will use pass, of time. But thank you. Yeah. So I'm looking forward, but thank yeah. you, though. I appreciate it. Thanks. Commissioner Gordon, we're, we're letting Thank you. to my left go last, and he'll take all the time you <laughs> saved us. I'm sorry. Okay, well, I'm going to be really relatively brief this morning. Uh, first and foremost, want to start out mentioning the Ellsworth Cemetery is now part of the Civil War Heritage Area. Um, as many of you may be aware, uh, the city of Westminster annexed in the Ellsworth Cemetery, which was a huge benefit for a variety of reasons, one being the fact that it gave uh, additional security with the uh, city police being able to oversee that area. Another thing it did was it, it started to open the opportunity for grants and other options uh, financially to assist the uh, the cemetery. So the them being included, the Ellsworth Cemetery being included as part of the Civil War Heritage Area opens up a lot of grants. I know we had a uh, uh, a grant in front of us last Thursday that was part of the Civil War Heritage Area, and that also kind of dovetails into that. So this is a great opportunity to see that not only is the cemetery uh, uh, supported for many, many generations to come, but it also allows for financial options that will help make that uh, easier for all those involved. So could, can't say enough how thrilled I am to see that. I think this is absolutely wonderful for Carroll County and obviously its residents and the history of our county. Uh, secondly, I want to bring up just really briefly uh, Liquid Library is a uh, new downtown business that's opened in Westminster. It's across from the old post office. If uh, anyone is wondering where Liquid Library is located, they opened uh, the end of last week. So, you know, wood-fired kitchen and craft cocktails. It was absolutely packed on Friday night when I walked by. But uh, always happy to see another small business and want to welcome them to the community. And uh, I also wanted to mention very quickly, can't not mention this unfortunately we had the the passing of herb cell which was a uh, icon in carroll county uh heavily involved in the music scene here and just all around incredible person in our community there will be a viewing on february 2nd from 2 to 2 p.m to 7 p.m at bethel assembly of god uh, herb cell passed at the age of 94 and uh, for anyone that knows Herb or any of his involvement, he was heavily involved in uh, music, but also at Westminster High School. He was responsible for bringing many musical celebrities to the school, which included Duke Ellington attending twice, Count Basie, uh, Woody Herman, Les Brown, and a variety of other uh, notables all over the years. So I just wanted to mention his passing for all. I'm certain mo most people know, but I just wanted to mention that as well. So thank you. And thank God, you. Oh. Got to keep him close. Are you okay if I go last, last? Are you okay? What, whatever you want to do, yeah. Okay, Commissioner Vigliotti. Thank you, Commissioner Connor. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, so on Friday, Carroll County Economic Development Director Denise Beaver and myself had the pleasure of being given a tour by Camden Zahn of the Valor Biomedia facility outside of Tawnytown, where clean chicken eggs are carefully and meticulously gathered to be distributed around the world for use in vaccines. And you can see from the picture there that I did not uh, forego the tie in lieu of the tour. Uh, so Denise does an absolutely amazing job. Um, you know, having been with her on a number of visits or, or seen her in action, uh, you know, she, she really does do us well as a county. So Valo Biomedia uh, has been in business since the 1930s uh, and is the world's leading producer of clean eggs. And this incredible company has one of its centers right here in Carroll County. And so naturally, Denise and I were quite curious as to, to why they chose us. And uh, they chose us because they knew somebody who was familiar with the area, but also because we were centrally located uh, along the East Coast and because of our proximity to airports. Uh, it's also interesting because although the clean eggs are used for medical purposes, the raising and keeping of the chickens, the collection of the eggs, it's a very agricultural endeavor. You know, they're very careful about taking care of the chickens, making sure the chickens have everything that they need. Uh, you know, it's very, very humane treatment of the chickens. And I, I think this speaks to the ways in which agriculture in our county is becoming quite adaptive. You know, from the crucial traditional farming of crops and livestock, uh, livestock to agritourism, such as wineries, horticulture, and locally sourced products to now life-saving medical uh, uses as well. I bring this up for two reasons. Uh, you know, first of all, farmers and anyone involved in agriculture often get mocked or maligned for somehow being a part of the past as if growing food to feed human beings had somehow become unnecessary. And our very agrarian, agrarian county often gets maligned and mocked for being so rural, for our faith, our values, our way of life, and yet we see more people wanting to move here than move out. There aren't enough houses that are available for people to move in. And you know whether they're farmers or new neighbors moving into single family homes, they're fierce defenders of farming and our general way of life. And, and you can see that most clearly every time we have a public hearing on something like zoning. And the second reason, and then I'll end with this, uh, the second reason is to underscore that farming remains so vitally important to us and our county, especially in the 21st century. And you know that Carroll doesn't stand at a crossroads, but at a broadening path where the cutting edge and the time-tested traditions both form something utterly innovative and absolutely American. You know, whether we speak of farmers using GPS to plant crops or computer, computers to monitor dairy cows, whether we speak of methods for producing wine or raising of and caring for clean chickens and clean eggs or medical uses, you know, we are in real time demonstrating the, the crucial daily role that agriculture plays in all of our lives. And in these ways, Carroll certainly stands at the forefront of the nation. And uh, Commissioner Kyler, that is all for me this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't have very much. Um, I do want to mention, since you mentioned uh, the, the visit you did, there are so many ag-related businesses in Carroll County that aren't a traditional farming. And like you also said, the traditional farmers um, have so much more technology than, than they did in the past. And, and it's, it's just, it's, we're blessed. It's, it's amazing, too, what they do, what agriculture does now. I mean, yes, you absolutely have to have food to eat, but the way that things get done now really is incredible. Very American, too. Yep. Yep. It's great. And, uh, and that's why one of the many reasons I love Carroll County. Amen. Um, Commissioner Rothstein and I were in Annapolis yesterday and did our MAKO meetings um, and a lot of bills. And I, I'm confused. Maybe when, when you get up here, you can tell <coughs> us. I hear from some groups that bills are slower this year, and then I hear from others that they're actually more and they're quicker. So I'm not sure what's going on. Not that Annapolis would ever have chaos, but uh, maybe that's what's happening. Um, I want to thank our delegation. We met with uh, the majority of the delegation, and, and I just think communicating with them is great, and we get a lot of good feedback. They're very busy the whole session, but I think the start maybe even more so. and. It doesn't give us a lot of time to talk, and I, I give them credit because they'll pack in a break from 12:30 to one, or one to 1:30, or whatever break they have, and talk, and and it it all benefits Carroll County. Next week is the state of the state and a governor's reception after that, and uh, 
I plan to be down there for for both of those plus we'll have a Mako meeting before that'll probably make it hard to meet with uh, the the delegates but and it's even amazing uh, Senator Hester we passed in the hallway you know and we talked for five minutes uh, now like typically with ladies she hugged uh, Commissioner Rothstein and shook hands with me but you know <laughs> That's that's the way it goes when I'm traveling with him, but uh, it was great to see her. And and uh, even though she doesn't re represent Carroll County anymore, she cares about us and helps out with a lot of stuff. And and we saw a few other people walking around. And look forward to next week and see who we see at the governor's reception. A veteran celebration. We had our committee meeting, and I wanted to mention that today. There's flyers out. It's Sunday, May 5th. And there's another flyer that talks about sponsorship op opportunities, and we need those. And it's just a great event, and put it down on your calendar and, uh, and look forward to being there. Are they still looking for volunteers to work that day? Yes. Okay. Oh, they're, they're still looking for volunteers. They're still, I think they're still looking for at least one band, maybe two. And then uh, they were planning a flyover with Air National Guard and I think they're getting activated and won't be available to do it which is a uh, a shame that there's a need for them to be activated but it just shows you uh, um, what our current servicemen and veterans have done and and they never know what's next but but yes they're, they're still looking for volunteers sorry I kind of went off no 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 um, not at all Board of Education, they had their uh, budget work session last night. Uh, Commissioner Rothstein went and uh, nothing, I think they only had two speakers and nothing really changed in their budget. They talked about it and uh, there'll be more to come on how that's going to work out, but um, they're moving forward with it. I want to mention that, um, and I don't know any of the details for the family yet, but Past Commissioner Donald Dell lost his wife Leona yesterday early morning, I think 6 a.m. yesterday morning, and uh, he was a commissioner and they've been in ag, their family's in ag for forever, they, they are active, his children, his grandchildren, they're all active in committees and, and things going on, it's great. and. Uh, I don't know if any of the family is paying attention this morning, but I've got to tell one story about Leona Dell. I wrestled with uh, her son Greg at North Carroll High School, and she was an avid fan. And uh, Greg was a better wrestler than I was. Um, I think he'd have won states. We didn't have states back then. We have a picture in our, I think, senior, might have been junior yearbook. She's in the stands cheering for her son Greg. And her feet are, I think, above the seat, both in front of her and behind her. She's jumping up because he just won. And uh, it just shows you uh, wrestling fans are still crazy. And no offense, Leona, you were crazy too. And we <laughs> loved you being there. That's all for me. Item one, legislative update. Morning, commissioners. Morning, Morning. Mike. How are you today? Good, good. Uh, so to your point about the flow of bills, yes, the, the, there are fewer bills this year, it seems. Um, now, Senator West mentioned to us yesterday that his committee is flooded with bills, which stands to reason because he's in the judicial proceedings and all of the crime bills and gun bills are all going through that committee, and there are many of them this year. But I think that generally, I, I thought, I sort of speculated that maybe that they were encouraged not to submit revenue bills. I don't think that's the case. I think it's because DLS is still scattered about the campus because their building is under construction. Uh, and, and you probably heard the MAKO folks yesterday saying they're waiting for a big bill drop. So they'll be coming. There'll be a lot more. <laughs> don't worry. Um, just quickly on the budget, I, I told you I'd get some data on the community colleges and I've provided that for you. So you'll see that, uh, that Carol takes a 6% a hit in the FY 2025 budget. 
also, we mentioned BRFA last week. That's a Budget Reconciliation and Financing Act. That's the bill that makes structural changes in the law that, that's, that is required to enable all of these budget items to move forward. <clears throat> the, the Cade funding formula is something that has to be changed in the law. It is in the, in the BRFA to, re, to rebase that funding formula. So they're going to be affected going forward unless something changes. And I'm sure that the colleges will be <coughs> lobbying budget and tax committee very strongly, uh, along with MECO on, on their behalf. Uh, the community colleges, are you going to mention that again? Or is that, that are, are people, that's a lot of money statewide. and. Two of the community college actually gain a little bit. Frederick is lose. one. Mm -hmm. Carroll County's maybe in the middle. There's some lose more than they do. Are they fighting that, or is that what? What do you What do you think? Th about they that? have an association just like the counties do, and uh, I think his name is Brad Phillips. Don't quote me on that. I think that's his name, Dr. Brad Phillips. Um, yes, he's he's lobbying them very hard. Um, and, and there's a lot of sympathy, frankly, across the General Assembly for higher ed. Um, so it's, it's hard to know whether th this proposal in the budget is, is strong or whether it's sort of a starting point negotiating. That's my guess. It's a, a point from which to negotiate. Uh, but I think there's going to be a lot, a lot of people behind community colleges. It's, it's workforce. Um, it's, it's reducing college expenses overall, people that hit two year and move on to four year. So th they do an immense amount of good in the state. And uh, I'm not so sure it's going to end up the way you see it here. I mean, you have to wonder, there's so much emphasis on doing things for the underserved. Well, the community colleges do. Mm -hmm. And then uh, probably not very popular, but you see other bills talking about ex-college kids and help with their student debt. Maybe if they'd have been smart enough to go to community college for a couple years, they wouldn't have all the student debt they have. And, and I still don't understand every loan I've signed for, I've paid for. It wasn't a question. And, uh, but this is a very cost-effective way to, to get started on your education. And, and in, in, in defense of, of many of the college students, I still don't know what I want to do. They, they change their minds, and they end up a, a year longer. And the community college is a good place to go and get a taste of what you may want to do or what you may learn you don't want to do, where some of the four-year places, that's a pretty expensive lesson. Yeah, all really, really strong points. Um, yeah, I, I'm personally very, very strongly in favor of community college. I think the opportunities there are just very wide and important. So hopefully things will change in that respect. Uh, we had a hearing on the purchasing, on, on your purchasing bill yesterday. No, no questions asked. I don't see that as being a problem. This year we got in early, so we were, we were good. Uh, let's talk about a few of these bills. Uh, another workers' compensation, uh, occupational disease presumption. This one adds three types of cancers. We're going to seek an amendment to ask the state to fund those benefits for those additional cancers. Considering the budget situations, hard to believe that, that amendment may make it, but uh, still, I believe it's important. Uh, also, adding hearing loss uh, to compensable benefits, hearing loss and tinnitus. Just a uh, an opinion, but I'm not sure how you can isolate tinnitus, especially somebody who grew up in the 70s with all that loud music. So you were a uh, 70s metalhead? <sighs> not metal, <laughs> but loud. <laughs> um, I saw him with a fog hat t-shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> we could go on. <laughs> Uh, Senate Bill 578, so this is uh, increasing the funding in an existing uh, 
volunteer, professional volunteer firefighting innovative cancer screening technologies program. So very important program. Uh, it increases funding from 100,000 to 500,000 annually. Um, I wanted to bring this bill to you, House Bill 470, County Income Tax Rate and Income Brackets Alterations, uh, because this is something that I think that some, someone sees this that may catch their attention because it's talking about county income tax. Um, the first thing I want to say is this is authorizing or enabling. This enables you to adopt this or enables a county to adopt this. Over the past uh, probably two sessions, there's been an effort on some of the more progressive counties to try to establish a, a, uh, a bracketed uh, tax regime aimed at higher income people. Right now, counties don't have bracketing like the state and the feds do. Uh, right now, the, the ceiling on county income tax is 3.2%. This would enable a maximum of 3.7, beginning for the 2026 tax year. It would affect individual filing uh, over 250,000, and for joint head of household or surviving spouse filers, it would be 300,000 and above. All the revenue that's collected above three, the 3.2 rate must be directed to public education and transportation. So you'll see MAKO is supporting that because there are some counties that do want to enact this. Um, but again, it is authorizing. So if any of your constituents see this, hopefully you can explain that to them. Another bill we're seeing is that it's an effort that we've seen before, House Bill 640, improvements on agricultural land. So trying to assess agricultural land that has been improved for a commercial purpose associated with the farm. Um, so they establish value-added agri agricultural activities. Among those is alcohol production. Um, it does not include activities that are already prohibited by zoning. You see the changes in tax assessment are pretty dramatic. So if it's supporting an actively used farm, it's 5% of the full cash value of that building or structure. If it supports the value added activities, it's 25% of the full cash value. If it's an indoor equine arena, it's 50% of the full cash value. Ooh. So this, is, this could be very significant loss to <coughs> local property tax revenue. And for that reason, uh, the counties are opposing this. And this, the percentages we're seeing are on how the state would assess the property. Correct. Not, it, it has nothing to do with our tax rates, but the assessments we get from the state, we don't control. That's right. That's right. And it would be, be a percentage of those assessments. Yes. Now, would that be, would that be structured solely on the value-added agricultural activities, or are they looking at agricultural activities as a whole? They are, they are listed. Okay. They're, they're specified, and I can, I can get you what they are. If you could, I'd like to see yeah, that. Yeah, they define those. Thank you. Uh, education. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mike. No, and I ahead. wonder, too, um, if the state reclassifies how it taxes certain agricultural uses, does that mean that we would have to Re-examine our own zoning. No, okay. Just, I don't think so. No, no. Just curious. I'm sorry. I apologize, Mike. No, no. It's good to think those things through. <laughs> yes, yeah, some more bus stop bills. I think we've talked about one of these. There's another that's similar. So the first one, House Bill 540, it prohibits bus stops on an undivided highway of more than four lanes unless you have a crossing guard present. Or, and some type, or some type of red light system is enacted. And then the one that we've talked about previously is the camera uh, bill. That's also been modified from previous to uh, pertain to four or more lanes and vehicles traveling only in the opposite direction of the bus. Not sure why those qualifiers are in there. Um, 
I think I mentioned that the, the sponsor is now the majority leader. He was a, uh, a vice chair last year, now a, vi a majority leader, so a little bit more behind this bill. House Bill 609 is, uh, again, we, as we had last year, another collective bargaining bill for public libraries. So this, again, is authorizing. The difference in, in this bill is it's very explicit in laying out your right to reject any agreement um, based on uh, fiscal issues. And the library and the union must negotiate within the appropriated county funds. So you have a lot more explicit authority over any formation of a union with a public library. And, and that pertains, it says, to, to specifically whether or not that funding is present for what they want? Right. So what if, and, and, and forgive me, because I'm, I'm not, I don't know all the details of, of the bill that's being proposed. So what if, and I'm just going to make something up here, what happens if, if we are in, and I'm just going to, again, I'm going to make things up because this is in no way a reflection of our library. This has nothing to do with our libraries here in the county. If we are in uh, Tim Burke County, right, and the Tim Burke, <laughs> and the Tim Burke Public Library, uh, County Public Library System decides that they're going to have a uh, communist day, and we take issue with that and we challenge them on that, does this bill give them the ability to strike or to push back against us? Or I'm, I'm just trying to make sure because if it's, if, they're, if they want to do something but it has to be within fiscal confines, if they want to do something that's not financial but which we disagree with, does that still give them any authority or right or ability to strike or anything of that? If I, if I remember correctly, they, they do not have the ability to strike. Okay. Uh, in terms of those other things, um, I would say that you are funding the library in its activities. If I doubt whether that's something that you define when you fund the library. So, I mean, I, I'm going to look to Mr. Burke since it's happening in his county. <laughs> as to whether something like that would be an issue, but... We don't read books in my county. <laughs> that makes it easy. Yeah. Th so thank you, thank so you. I, I suppose that's an issue between you and, and the library, and, okay. and uh, sounds more like a legal question than... Well, you share funding with the library, and Ted knows more about, about this than I ever will. You, you share with the state... Uh, funding responsibilities, but you above go way above and beyond uh, your re legal responsibility each time, each year with the, with the library. So, thank you both very much. Uh, on to cannabis licensing locations. So this is a, a, a tricky bill, and our um, our Mako staffer that has this responsibility, Dominic Butchko, is is struggling with, <clears throat> with it as well, trying to get as much information from the counties as he can. <coughs> the, the bill essentially is, is trying to prevent the counties from zoning a cannabis dispensary more so than you would a liquor store. So it, it defines both a a liquor store and a dispensary. And then in here it says that a political subdivision may not adopt an ordinance establishing zoning requirements for licensed dispensaries that are more restrictive than zoning requirements for a retail dealer, which is a liquor store licensed under the article. So they're saying if you have zoning restrictions in place for a liquor store, you cannot create more restrictive zoning for the cannabis dispensary. The problem is, as I understand it, you don't currently restrict liquor stores no, in your they zoning code. Treat them the same way as drug stores and, and any other retail establishment. Right. So, is that something that we need to quickly take a look at? We are. Okay. Yeah, that, that's been communicated. So, what, what I'm talking about has been communicated to them, okay. and I'm going to continue to follow up. 
Thank you yeah. very much. We can't be the only ones in this situation. Right? Um, and the other is you can't adopt an ordinance that, that establishes a zoning requirement for a licensed grower cultivating cannabis outdoors. It's more restrictive than any requirement that existed on June 30th of 23 concerning a hemp farm. You don't regulate hemp farms either. Um, and, uh, and you don't regulate, out, obviously, outdoors. So there are some things in here that are a little sketchy, in, in my opinion. And uh, I think as this is written, it says, if you don't restrict them now, you can't restrict them in the future because you don't have anything in place. Thank you very much for that. So uh, Thank you very much I'm going to follow that one pretty, pretty closely. Does that look like it has legs? Well, it is Senator Feldman who is uh, chair of finance. So, just out of curiosity, Mike, um, there's a point here talking about pre-existing to specified locations when calculating a 500-foot distance buffer. Um, is that still allowing that 500-foot distance buffer, or is that looking to modify that? I think that's clarifying. Okay. So the daycare center would have to be there already for you Correct. to apply that. Right. You can't say next year there's going to be one there, so we're going to apply it. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Another bill that's that's uh, uh, could have some challenges for us, House Bill 577. This is a homeless shelter licensing program, so establishes the areas of regulation for a, a county or, or a nonprofit homeless shelter, uh, requires Department of Housing and Community Develop, uh, Development to develop these regulations. Uh, as far as Carroll goes, there's a potential for staffing and space challenges depending on how these regulations are developed. It's a very long list of things that are going to be included in the regulations. Uh, there are fines for violations, up to 10000 per violation. The county's going to oppose this basically because it's such a heavy lift uh, for just about everybody. Um, so we'll, we'll be pushing back on this one. Uh, another one that's challenging, House Bill 686, youth sports programs, venue-specific sp emergency action plans. This is another one that establishes a very long list of requirements. Uh, to be included in an action plan. Uh, so one of the, the main ones is having a defibrillator within a brief walk of every practice and event. So depending on the size of the, of the, uh, of the complex, that can be very challenging. And, and the action plan itself is very detailed. Uh, so once again, the counties are going to oppose that. The bill that uh, was in, in the MAKO, part of the MAKO package, is uh, battery safety. There were concerns brought primarily in the rural counties uh, about battery storage for solar being a fire risk in terms of how you address fighting those fires. Uh, this will create a, uh, a commission that will look at all the issues around that um, and develop a plan going forward so legislation can be can be written for that. That's interesting because these are some of the concerns that we brought up when we were dealing with the moratorium and then the, the discussion about community solar last year. That's very interesting to see that the state is looking at this now. Yes. Uh, there's another health bill that I, I wanted to bring your attention. I'd include in your packet, but it's, it's one that we saw last year. It became very, uh, uh, it, be, it became challenging, and you may remember this, but it's um, the Comprehensive Health Education Framework, House Bill 558. Essentially, it codifies what's currently the policy of the State Board of Education uh, dealing with health education. Um, there are aspects of that that enable an opt-out for two aspects of the list of which are mostly straightforward health issues. And that is family life and human sexuality and gender identity and sexual orientation. And you might remember last year that the sponsor of the bill got angry, I think, about challenges to this 
and about challenges to the superintendent. She stripped the entire bill and basically made it a punitive bill that would, uh, would withhold 20% of your state funding if you did not uh, develop, have your policy mirror the state policy. So this has now come in in its original form. The Carroll County Board of Education's policy is compliant with the bill as introduced. So we'll watch this one closely because I would suspect you will have the same group of opponents as you did last year. So we'll have to keep an eye on the chair on this one. And that's it for me today as far as outbound. Got a couple quick questions for you. Going back to HB 470, that county income tax bill, don't certain counties, and maybe it's based on their form of government, I just don't know the answer to the question. Don't they already have the ability to raise their income taxes above 3%? No? 3.2 is, 3 .2 is the max. That's the ceiling. In right. the state. Okay. And, and a couple counties, because of Blueprint, have asked to, that's, that's how they want to handle mm -hmm. Blueprint, is raise taxes above the max. Well, that's convenient. Yeah. Convenient for them to be able to say that. But I mean, I know certain counties in the state are unlivable practically because the, the cost of living. And but now they want to go ahead and raise income taxes and property taxes. I mean, we know where, you know, I could go on and on and about this. So Yeah. A Anne Arundel was the one that proposed this last session mm -hmm. and the bill was a little different last session because it it also it sort of required a balancing of sorts that if you if you increase the rate on higher incomes you had to provide relief to the lower brackets yeah. so that you you sort of came out even yeah. this bill doesn't have any of that to it it simply directs anything above the 3.2 has to go to education yeah it'll be fun to watch uh, it'll be fun to watch because uh you know, the, the talk right now is the cost of, you know, the cost of living in Maryland is so high. So let's take more money from people. <laughs> I mean, that's well. just the bottom line. Um, I do have an ask for you for next week as well. Um, there's a Senate bill, Senate Bill 738. And I know it's foolish to try to track every single bill and get too upset about every single bill because a lot of them don't make it to the light of day. But Senate Bill 738 is interesting, and I'm trying to read through it, but it almost seems to uh, criminalize in a way um, state uh, county board of eds and county governing bodies from getting involved with what are in libraries so I wouldn't if, if you can take a look okay. at that bill and sort of give us maybe a cliff notes version of it next week because yes you know I'm trying to read through this and it's it's not surprising but it's a bit disturbing because that sounds like exactly what it's trying to do so. yeah that's the right to read Act if I the freedom to read because you need the freedom to read. Yeah, I haven't read through the bill. Important freedom. I, I heard heard it was coming, so I haven't seen the text yet. I think the text just became available. And quickly, from what I understand, is it it has each county establish their policy for their library collections. So it's not a top-down approach. It's for each county to develop their own set of conditions, if you will, for their collection. So that's really all I know. That might about be it. an aspect to it, but there's some. Again, of course, there's some other interesting things in there. But well, I think the title alone certainly yes. raises a lot of interest. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we'll bring that one forward. Uh, just again, Cliff yep. Notes version of it. Evidently, right. Delegate Mangione is is doing a bill to restrict books in, I, I'm not sure, school libraries. I think it's school libraries. It's just school libraries. Mm -hmm. He wants that, that done statewide. That would be completely a counter to, to this bill, it seems. Yes. And, 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 and to me, um, I'm learning all the time, but it's a big difference when, like the uh, voting for a student rep, they wanted to put that bill in to mandate it for everybody. And then there's other bills where they enable it and we actually get our choice. And mm -hmm. some of those bills I still don't like, but at least it doesn't make us do something. And, and it, it's strange how they do that. And, and that, that bill, was, I think, was put in by Frederick County because they want their student rep to vote. 
but yeah. why make everybody in the state do it? You know. Yeah, that that I'm all, I'm always amazed by that, and that's been floating around the state for a number of different years. But that you would give, you know, you have to get elected to board of educations, but you're going to allow somebody to vote who is not duly elected. So I I hope that goes nowhere. But at least at yeah. the very least, like you said, Commissioner Kyle, we given a choice. Yeah, but because right now it mandates and it it gets a little bit more. It gets more scary every year. They keep yeah. submitting it, and it doesn't make it, but you you got to wonder. We talked about that yesterday. Sooner or later, is it going to make it through? And you heard one, one of the counties that has their student rep vote on the budget was very supportive. Kind of yes. clapped back at you about oh, yeah. maturity and such. So That is yeah. what, Well, we're all different. Amazing. Well, all, all these counties are different. They, these, these bills, in most cases, should be authorizing, frankly. You're, you're in position to make those decisions for your citizens, like every other county is. And if they choose to be more progressive, that's, that's fine. Go for it. And, and, and one of the, the strong points of MACO is they recognize that every county is different. And I'm not sure everybody in Annapolis thinks that way. They'd like them all to be the same. And l like you said, so uh, let's raise taxes and be just like them, huh? Yeah, and if you get if you have an issue that you, people can't the counties can't come to consensus on, then they're free to advocate in the way they see fit. So, uh, yeah, but the fact that most of these bills affect the counties in the same way and to basically the same degree makes it relatively easy to come up with a compromise on a position. And. And I'd like to ask you, and I'll email or text or something after the meeting, but some constituents have asked about the housing bills and specifically the numbers of each one. I, I think um, Commissioner Ralstein mentioned it in his podcast, but didn't give bill numbers. Okay. And so some, some of the people are asking, so I may, I've got the list of the ones MAKO looked at, but I, I want to try not to miss anything. Okay. We can do that. Absolutely. Anything else, guys? Mike, thank you so much as always. Yes, thank you. It's enough pain for a day, right? <laughs> <laughs> Have fun down there. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Um, now we're going to talk about pool repairs at Hashua with Rec and Parks. Maybe. Yeah. It might be at one of the parks. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There's a little bit of a delay on the TV out there. So. Oh, no okay. worries, no worries. Well, you're welcome to come in here and like be with us. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> that's, that's, that isn't that tactful. It's a, yeah, it's a nice way of saying we're boring. <laughs> oh no, I watch it the whole time. Yeah, yeah. from beginning yeah, to end. <clears throat> Even the reruns. Absolutely. <laughs> During the Ravens game, I was watching, of course, here in, uh, in Hampstead, and friends were watching in Florida and North Carolina, and they must have been five or six or seven seconds ahead of me because every, every once in a while your phone would ding and then you'd see a fumble. Or a, very frustrating. So. All right. Uh, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Recreation and Parks, <coughs> requests your approval to award a contract to Patriot Pool Services, LLC, for the necessary pool repairs at um, Hoshua Environmental Center in the amount of $42,695. This purchase will be made from a Howard County contract that Carroll County will utilize. This amount is within the fiscal year 24 approved budget and no additional funds will be necessary. Okay, and anything else you wanna share with us about the pool, why it needs it and how long it's been there and <clears throat> well, the pool was built in 1977, and we had it reconditioned in 2008 or 9, I believe. Um, and the, the life cycle of those repairs are, are um, pretty much done. Um, the pool coping, 40 to 50 percent of the pool coping needs to be replaced. So, if you start replacing it in bits and pieces, it kind of compromises the ones adjacent to it. So, since we're removing 40 or 50 percent. We're going to remove, remove them all and replace everything as well. Um, the pool, uh, the interior of the pool, the shell of the pool needs to be parged so it's waterproof again. And we're also making some other minor repairs, replacing some tiles, warning tiles, and um, 
Uh, we're replacing the tiles to the ramp that goes down into the depth of the pool. So it's more compli ADA compliant. So it's typical cool. repairs, basically. Who, who uses the pool and, and when? Uh, Brad, you can help me out with that. <laughs> the pool is utilized by our user groups that rent f the facility there, and they do pay a fee for that use. Uh, and we have that pool open from Memorial Day to Labor Day. So quite a few uh, groups do come out. 4-H, the Y, they are some of our primary user groups. Uh, Camp Opportunity is another group that comes out there that utilizes that facility. So there's quite a few groups that do use that pool so and and today's world this is probably a little bit of a dumb question but there are there special needs groups use it is it fully accessible is there anything we need to modify or it's it's all oh, they're there no it has a ramp into it that's a, so yeah. that was original design motion to award a contract to patriot pool service llc in the amount of forty two thousand six hundred ninety five dollars second I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Switch. Yep. Now we get to talk with Rec and Parks about tree service. Uh, all right. Um, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of, or, yeah, Department of Recreation and Parks, requests your approval to award a term contract for on-call tree trimming and maintenance services for park locations to Mead Tree and Turf Care Incorporated with a not to exceed contract price of $135,000 per year. The amount of, of work required will determine exact costs. Carroll County will be piggybacking Frederick County contract that was competitively bid. This amount has been approved in the fiscal year 24 budget. Be before um, specific on this, and and we piggyback a lot of things and it's a good way to do stuff but purchasing looks hard at the options to bid something to piggyback to annual contracts etc do you feel like um, we're giving as much consideration as possible to local businesses by the methods we do it in yeah actually Mead tree is in Carroll County um, and when looking at the specs and other bids that I was able to find that people were, I thought, looking for the same thing, it was pretty much regular tree work. This is like a on-call emergency type tree work. Um, and I want to say that he is in Woodbine, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and so that was a big part that I thought, okay, this would be a good one to uh, to piggyback because he is right here down the street. Good. So maybe in the future, if we have companies that are in Carroll County, we could specifically note that, or does that is that not permissible uh, on the the briefing papers? Like, because so, Commissioner Collar asked a good question. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think there's any prohibition to doing that. Yeah. Frequently, we do when it's a um, a RFP. We frequently locate. Lo list well, where right, they're located right. um, but certainly something like this would be cool to to know we'll, we'll try <laughs> been around for a while. and and uh some counties have a local preference even when they bid um cecil county did i'm not sure if they they still do and it uh, it's depends on how you look at it a lot of local businesses don't like that because if we give a personal preference then what if Baltimore Frederick and all the ones around us do it, it's it's too edged how you do it and I know that's been talked about <coughs> different times too but it's nothing wrong with saying they're local but we we do not give a preference right motion to award the contract for on-call tree trimming and maintenance services to Mead Tree and Turf Care Incorporated not to exceed one hundred thirty five thousand dollars per year second any more questions discussion all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right. So now we're going to talk to Rec and Parks about mowing. Yeah. Um, so the Office of Procurement in cooperation with the Department of Recreation and Parks requests your approval to award Linwood Lawn and Landscape LLC a term contract for mowing services for 23 locations throughout the county in the amount of $441,630.90. 
this amount is within the fiscal year 24 budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Um, and I can tell you that this is a contract that is, uh, it was facilities. And so the these guys know about the change. I meant to kind of put that in there and I just realized this morning I left that part out. So I wanted to definitely bring it up. And, and for years, facilities was doing some maintenance, but you're taking over. Correct. Yeah. And when we get like complaints about mowing or lack thereof, we'll be the first ones to be contacted. So we'll be the, and we'll be responding agency. So. And, and you're looking at that with subcontractors and employees, both. Um, we will not be doing any mowing mine. on those park sites right. with county staff. Okay. Uh, the two parks that, or well, three parks that we have current county staff at, the sports complex, Hoshua and Piney Run, uh, they will continue to do their own mowing. Uh, but these are the other community park sites that do not have park staff on site. And those sites are what we're discussing here for this contract. Okay, thanks. Motion to award a term contract to Limited Lawn and Landscape LLC in the amounts of $441,630.90. Second. So I have a motion and a second. Any more questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. What, what, were those, you, what were those three again? It was Piney Run, Hoshua, Hoshua and, and the sports, sports complex. complex. The sports complex. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. All right. And we also yeah. maintain uh, Half Acre, but there's not as much mowing that happens there. Yeah. But those are sites that we have staff gotcha. at. So that's why we'll continue to do what we're doing at those sites. Uh, and they're not part of this, this contract. contract. Yes. Right, but thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you, guys. OK, approval to purchase two ambulances. Good morning. Morning. Chief Harry. Oh, okay. All right. Um, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management and Warehouse Operations, requests your <coughs> approval to purchase two Demers MXP 170 ambulances on Ford F450 chassis from First Priority Emergency Vehicles Incorporated for fire EMS in the amount of $827,164.80. This purchase will be made utilizing an HGAC contract that was competitively lit. This amount is within the fiscal year 24 budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Good morning. So these units are being requested as part of the development of the county's fire and EMS fleet. Uh, fleet management and DFEMS have worked very closely for the past couple months to set standards and requirements for these units. And first priority group uh, is actually currently assembling two units um, the in, the, in this month of February. Um, they would then be transported for final upfitting at their location in Maryland. So we would expect these units within the matter of a couple of months. And these will be the first two full-time ambulance units in the county's fleet. Motion to approve the purchase of two Demers MXP-170 ambulances on Ford F-450 chassis from First Priority Emergency Vehicles Incorporated for the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in the amount of $827,164.80. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. What was that? <laughs> Now we want to talk about uh, approval to purchase uh, life pack defibrillators and accessories. Morning. Good morning. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Fire and EMS, requests your approval to award the purchase of life pack defibrillators and accessories from Stryker Medical in the amount of $93,660.16. This purchase will be made through the Maryland State Contract. BPO 001B260009 that was competitively bid. The funding for this purchase will be partially from a state grant and the remaining amount from county funds, which were transferred into the fiscal year 24 budget and approved by the board in the December 14, 2023 open session. In the, the purchase of these units, the uh, Life Pack 15, will be an additional unit that's in the county. Um, to help with additional staffing and additional 
deliveries of services to the community. Um, the AEDs that we're requesting, the 20 AEDs, would also do the same with that and start to replace some of the aging equipment at the volunteer stations that are out there now. Um, and obviously we get that a little bit cheaper by using the state, state funding and also the grant from MIMS to, to get those units. Awesome. Motion to award the purchase of life pack defibrillators and accessories from Stryker Medical in the amount of $93,660 and 16 cents. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Now we want to discuss with uh, Department of Technology Services uh, VISTA Software License Contract Amendment. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. 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 The Office of Procurement in cooperation with the Department of Technology Services requests your approval to amend the current, current VISTA Software License Agreement with Personnel Data Systems, PDS, in the amount of 48528 The additional license costs are funded in the fiscal year 24 budget. Morning, Commissioners. Um, as you are aware, VISTA is the new um, human resources um, system that has been put into place. It's now active and employees are using it. Um, they have multiple tiers for licensing. For uh, several years, we carried it at 1150 because obviously it wasn't active and people weren't using it. Now that we have all of the people coming on board, um, we do need to take it up to the next level, which is the 1650 level. And just to uh, um, not give you a whole lot of information, but some of this is going to be um, fire EMS. You know, we're going to be hiring all, already hired some people, we're going to be hiring more, so we needed additional licenses for those. And then we do have a couple of outside um, county agencies that aren't part of our payroll, like the Library and Humane Society, but still use our benefits, so they need to have access to the system as well. So that's what the change is. And 1650 should last us for a while. They're five, they do them in five blocks of 500. Cool. Um, Motion to approve the amendment to the current VISTA software license agreement with personnel data systems in the amount of $48,528. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks. you. Have Thank a great you. day. Thank you. you too. Okay. Uh, item 8, uh, approval to submit application and acceptance of award of a transportation and land use connection grant program from the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Claire, who's going to describe our, uh, our grant application for um, the BRTB Transportation and Land Use Connection Grant Program. All right, good morning. So the Bureau of Comprehensive Planning is requesting your approval to submit a grant application um, to the Transportation and Land Use Connections Grant Program. Uh, this is a program offered by the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board um, to provide short-term technical assistance to local, um, local governments in the region to help implement changes to the built environment, um, which can be reduced traffic, um, and, and enable people to easily walk, bike, and use transit. So this is a competitive grant open to all members of the uh, Baltimore um, Regional Transportation Board. So the county's grant application is for a bicycle and pedestrian planning and feasibility study in uh, the Finksburg area. The study will prioritize safety and accessibility to identify bike pet options in the Finksburg community, specifically um, right in that uh, more uh, commercial and industrial corridor. Um, and if awarded, the project is expected to kick off in March and be completed within a year. Uh, the study will inform us whether there are safe and viable options to connecting residents <coughs> and commercial properties along the corridor, and if so, what that network might look like. Um, and beyond that, the study will help guide the next Finksburg plan update. Uh, so we, we are requesting $80,000 from BRTB, and there's no local um, dollar match for that. Um, and if awarded, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council will manage the project and then comp planning staff, myself, will work closely with the consultant and BMC um, to make sure that uh, we provide the information needed, input, and to review the product to ensure that we are on the, um, 
uh, the deliverable is timely and as we are desiring it to be. So I'm here to answer any questions if you have them. I do have one real quick if I might. Um, mm -hmm. So you're talking the commercial and industrial area in that vicinity. Is there any, are we talking like 140? Or are we talking the surrounding roads that connect to that area in the Finksburg corridor? Like where are we, yeah. where are we looking at specifically? Sure, so we'd be looking at um, pretty much the Finksburg growth area, okay. so which is that um, 140, 90, 91 uh, intersection, um, DD Road, so just over the reservoir. Yeah. Okay. It's a fairly small planning area. Okay. When, when uh, State Highway did some of their public meetings on the intersection 140 and 91, there was a lot of consistency citizen concern on why they had bike lanes mm -hmm. and to the point of there's not a whole lot of people riding to work in Owings Mills and there's not a whole lot of people with bikes going through that intersection so it'll be interesting to see how they evaluate that mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and uh, uh, the state was all but mandated to have bike lanes and it's been an issue in in the city it's been an issue out here but you know, one, 140, it just doesn't seem like that's a good place for a bike lane. Now, they have every right to ride, but I, I just have to wonder how often. So uh, that was a good mm -hmm. question. Yeah, and to speak to that, the um, the Finksburg Quarter Plan does, um, it recommends no bicycle or pedestrian infrastructure right on 140, and understandably, um, that's an, an arterial road, it's high speed, high traffic. Um, so we're trying to figure out if there are uh, network options for connecting the residents and commercial um, businesses that don't involve um, riding or walking right on 140 and preferably not 91 either. So, so. you're ahead of us. I'm trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> if she's on a bike and we're walking, she's definitely ahead of us. Yes, <laughs> yes. Hopefully. <laughs> Motion to approve the submission and acceptance of the Transportation and Land Use Connection Grant for the Finksburg Bicycle and Pedestrian Planning Feasibility Study. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. If opposed? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Have a good day. Um, do we have any public comment? Yes, sir. I believe I do have a caller online if they could hit star six to unmute. And state your name and the area you're calling from today. Yes, caller. You're unmuted in our system. You can make sure your phone isn't muted itself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to unmute myself on this, this end. Should I start over? <laughs> Please do. Thank you. Hello? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Catherine Adelaide, Carroll County Republican Central Committee. You guys are cruising this morning. I'm glad I got on in time. I almost missed it. Uh, we met uh, last Thursday, our committee, uh, January 25th um, at 6.30 p.m. at the South Carroll Senior Center. And I wasn't at liberty to share the big Carroll County um, Republican Central Committee news because our meeting happened after uh, your meeting. So, but now um, I can announce um, our big news is we have a vacancy on the committee. Former member Jay Savigny uh, has resigned. We will miss Jay and I thank him for his service to the committee and we wanna wish him the best in his future endeavors. And as uh, sad as I am to see Jay go, I'm always excited about filling the vacancy because it's an election and as the chair of election integrity subcommittee on the committee um, elections always excite me and election integrity begins in the Carroll County Republican Central Committee so anyway um, I'm excited to learn and participate you know in this election as well uh, we have an application process and then the remaining members uh, will proxy vote for our uh, for our Republican constituents but the next um, new member. So I wanted to invite all of Carroll County registered Republicans to apply, including you. You probably didn't know that you could <laughs> sit on the board as well as hold your commissioner position. And I only know that because when I ran for commissioner, my campaign manager asked me to run for central committee. I didn't even know what the central committee was or did. Shame on me. Um, 
But I won that election, and I've been absolutely thrilled to serve in it ever since. Um, so uh, it's really more fun than a reality show. So I know you're very busy, but just know that that's an option for you as well. We would welcome any one of you, as well as all of our other Republican constituents. Um, it's really a, a fun volunteer job. <laughs> and I think so that we make a difference. So I encourage um, everybody to um, get involved with that. Um, I'm sorry I missed your legislative uh, update. Um, I do do some uh, legislative work. Um, one big you know, item coming up, I don't have the bill numbers in front of me, is assisted suicide, which uh, the RNC platform does not support assisted suicide. I do meet a fair number of Republican elected people and constituents who seem to uh, want to support that, mainly because of their compassion. And I think the part, I just explained it to one um, elected official, and uh, she was like, well, now that I understand what you're really talking about, yeah, I couldn't support that either. Again, it's the role of the government in making a life and death decision like that. Uh, government doesn't give us a right, so our inalienable rights come from God, and we each have free will. So God forbid, I don't wish that anyone would choose to terminate their own life because uh, nobody's cheating death. But it is uh, that right. What I object to, and the RNC uh, platform objects to, is the government funding this initiative and paying for the medication to deliberately terminate human life, whether it's from terminal illness or aging or whatever. I've lost two aged parents, one I saw suffer incredibly, um, and had assisted suicide been legal in, in Virginia, she probably would have chose that, my mother. Um, she went on to recover and um, died eight months later, and she had a good quality of life. So, um, you know, I do have to, I will be testifying against that. Um, and and please finish your thoughts. I attended the Trump, yes, I attended the Tri-District Republican Club meeting um, where we had a great election integrity. Uh, Commissioner Kyler was there, was very well attended. Um, I'll send you an update since my time is up. Thank you all for your uh, for your support and for all the work you do. God bless. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have, sir. Thank you. Um, close minutes. We need approval for the uh, close minutes from 125. Um, 24. Motion to approve. Second. Any more discussion or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. Agendas. Hello, Wanda. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. And I think I want to note um, things are starting to really pick up, and we go through these agenda, but there's probably going to be additions because things seem to be picking up and uh, and and being added. So I want everybody to understand that. And. Monday, February 5th, no items. On Tuesday, February 6th, uh, a 1 p.m. meet and greet with the Special Secretary of Opioid Response. And then at 6.30 is a, a Town Hall, Maryland's Office of Overdose Response. And uh, I cannot make that anymore. On Wednesday, February 7th, uh, Mako in Annapolis, Commissioner Kyler and Rothstein, um, more Mako in Annapolis, the State of the State meeting, and that's followed by a reception um, with the governor. And that starts at 1. And I'm going to talk with Goose Ridge Soap's ribbon cutting, but I will be there. And uh, I, I'm obligated to be there. And we may have to drive separately so I can get back in time. But I will make sure if they've heard the agenda, there's um, no fear that I won't be there. Thursday, February 8th, uh, I closed administrative session. And then the open session under priority <coughs> care, we're going to do a marriage week proclamation with uh, Amy Guilford and item one is legislative update again item two um, consolidated transportation program 
Item three, St. George's Gate Stormwater Management Facility Retrofit. Item four, additional engineering services uh, for Department of Recreation and Parks. A change order, Commissioner Rothstein's favorite. Yes, mm. yes, he loves change orders. He'll be here. Um, and again, I, I won't be shocked if there's more items that pop up. Um, Friday, we show nothing. On Saturday, the February 10th, there's 6 p.m. Lime, Limeboro Volunteer Fire Department, and uh, I'm going there with a date. Oh. Uh, yeah. And uh, I have the podcast that week. The following week, uh, Monday, February 12th, shows no activities. Tuesday, February 13th, um, Ag Center Board Meeting, uh, Commissioner Kyler. Um, Wednesday, February 14th, Mako and Annapolis, Commissioner Kyler and Rothstein. Board of Ed meeting um, with their preliminary budget adoption on their agenda. And right now we show no one attending that. Um, Thursday, February 15th, administrative meeting and then open meeting. Item one, legislative update. Item two, budget quarterly update. Item three, um, zoning for adult use cannabis. Item four, updates to annual plan for Carroll County Bureau of Housing. And this is a public comment. It says displayed for public comment for a 45 day period based on federal regulation, but it isn't an, uh, uh, in our session, it isn't a hearing or public comment or anything, correct? It's yeah. just, an, it's it just is. A, normal, a normal agenda item. Um, the, the, all this this um, process is very prescribed by the Department of Housing, Federal Department of Housing, and um, they, they come and they give you the overview of the annual plan, and then once you approve that, then it's published. Then it's open. For five days, right. But poop, if someone wanted to come and give public comment, you know, on the normal agenda item, they'd be welcome to, but then it's open for 45 minutes. Okay. Item five, uh, approval to purchase uh, learning platforms for fire and EMS. At 3 p.m. that day, there's a ribbon cutting in Westminster. We show no one attending yet. Um, Friday, Saturday shows no activities, and that's the week for Commissioner Gordon to do his podcast any more discussion changes no sir thank you thank you very much thank wanda. you wanda um and i guess we're ready for a motion to adjourn so moved second i have a motion a second all those in favor aye, aye. is anybody opposed to adjourning oh, we're safe oh i get to do this <laughs>